What a special day. I just love when parents bring their children into the house of the Lord to dedicate them. I'll be praying for your children. And I love the other children in the church. They're scattered through the pews. I didn't count today, but most of the time it's somewhere between a dozen and 25 that are here week by week. And if you were in here, you missed a delightful time in the Sabbath school class with the, for your kids and the adult class in the sanctuary. Yes, that starts around 9.30. A time of fellowship and a time of study. It's good to come into the house of the Lord. So, how is it in your life? Do you like waiting? It works something like this. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. It almost seems we're in a constant hurry because we've got something pressing that we might need to accomplish next although we're not sure what that is. It happens like this. As you wander through the store, getting groceries, taking your time, putting this in the basket and that in the basket, meandering down the aisles, you finally get up to the end and you have to make that dreaded decision. You know what I'm talking about. There are nine lanes in front of you. Do you go for the shortest or do you go for the longest? Or do you go somewhere in between? Because you're in a hurry and you don't want to wait too long. You know what I'm talking about? I want it and I want it now. Well, if it doesn't happen in the grocery store, maybe it happens in the airport. At age 16, I was had uh, the opportunity to save up a few hundred dollars and we were to travel to the general conference in Switzerland. The only problem was the plane was scheduled to leave at 2 p.m. At 3 p.m. came and there was some kind of mechanical issue that needed to be addressed and I said, good, let's get that fixed before we take off. At 4 p.m. it was further delayed And the parents started grousing at 6 p.m. And I'm thinking, what's the hurry? We're going to get there eventually. Sometimes patience is a matter of where you're at in life and what you're facing. 10 o'clock came and the parents were saying, let's take them home so they can get some sleep. We'll come back to the airport. Some 16 hours After it was due to leave, we were on the tarmac and the turboprops, yes indeed, they were turboprops during that day, spun up and we took off. It seems that as time moves on, we continually get more and more impatient. Can you relate? It used to be you would wait for a piece of mail. If it didn't come one day, it would be the next. Now you wait for email. Why isn't it here? And email is even slow because there's always instant what? Instant messaging and texting. With the presupposition that somebody on the other end has their phone held in their hand and they've just been waiting to receive your text and you will text them back Immediately, and if more than 45 seconds go by, you start tapping your phone as if they're on the other end, just waiting for your message. How is it with this waiting? How is it with this patience? Our scripture today talks about the promise. It seems very fitting that today, October 22, 2016, we reflect back on an 
October 22, 1844. Thank you, historians. Let me set the context. Because in October 22, 1844, there was a great religious awakening across America. Seventh-day Adventist Church had yet to be formed. So there were Lutheran, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists. A Baptist preacher named William Miller had determined from his study of Daniel uh, that Jesus was coming on October 22, 1844. Did he get that right? (laughs) Thank you. No, he did not get that right. He read, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. He understood that to be the world, when it was the heavenly sanctuary. But they looked with eager anticipation, longing that Jesus might come and might come soon. So I ask you the question today, how are you at waiting? How are you at anticipating that the promise given in John chapter 14 will be a realization in our lifetime. That promise, that promise in John chapter 14 talks about the promise when Jesus said, if I go again, I will what? Come again and receive you unto myself that... Where I am, there you may be also. That is the promise. Is it as sure and focused today as when it was spoken by Jesus? Yes, it is. So we will reflect a little bit about that promise. The purpose, the people, and the place of that promise. We must look for a few minutes at some additional texts when we think about Jesus' second coming. The beginning of that promise started with a premise. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Did Jesus go? Come on, folks. Did Jesus go? Yes, Yes, he did. Your Seventh-day Adventist, You are in a Seventh-day Adventist church. Perhaps you're a guest here. But we're looking at two passages of Scripture that talk about the second coming of Christ. So if you were sitting on the bus next week, if somebody chatted with you and said, tell me about what do Seventh-day Adventists believe, we would hope that you would tell them about Jesus and the fact that he died on the cross for my sin and your sin. We would hope that you would tell them about the hope that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ of his soon second coming. And that hope is expressed in many different scriptures, but we'll look at just a few today. First, that coming. That coming will be a visible coming and an audible coming. Jot the scripture down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. People say, what's going to happen at Jesus' coming? You know, I've heard many different versions. I've heard versions where some people will be gone, just like that. Half of the bus load of folks, boom, they're gone mysteriously. You're flying in a plane, the the pilot's gone. Half of the passengers on the plane are gone and you're still sitting there. I'm not sure that that is in alignment with what the Bible teaches. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those are sleeping and awaiting the calling of our Lord Jesus Christ will come forth from the grave. And we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and there shall we be with the Lord forever. It's a visible, excuse me, 
It's a visible return, not a secret return or a secret rapture. Open your Bibles to Matthew today, Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. We'll look at just a few indicators in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. And there shall appear a sign of the Son of Man in the heavens. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's not a secret coming. It's not a secret rapture. All of heaven will be ablaze. I was reading in The Great Controversy, one of my favorite books. It said at midnight, it, at midnight, in the darkness of the night, Jesus will come. I don't know if that's a figurative peace or a literal peace, but the brightness of his coming, whether it's daylight or midnight, will light up the sky. Can you imagine it in your mind's eye? Can you imagine thousands upon thousands of angels and Jesus coming forth? I can't wait. How about you? I can't wait. How about you? There may be a delay. It may be a short delay. It may be days, weeks, months, years. But the promise is sure that Jesus is coming. Matthew chapter 24, verses, verse 27 says, that for as the lightning comes out of the east and shines unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Just as the lightning will light up the sky at night from the east, far as east to the west, all will be able to see the coming of Jesus. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Every eye will see him come. There's a warning, though, in Matthew chapter 24, that before he comes, there will be many who will claim to be Jesus. Have you heard of those who say, I am the Messiah, follow me? You can go back in recent history. Jim Jones, 1978, circa 1978, traveling first from I believe it was Indiana to Northern California, down to Di uh, Guyana. When the senator went down, he killed the senator and I believe four others. And 909 people lost their lives as the cyanide-laced Kool-Aid was dispensed. False Christs claiming to be the Messiah. False Christs claiming the message that they are Jesus. There is such warning, Matthew chapter 24, but if any man shall say unto you, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, in so that if it were possible, they would deceive, the Bible says who they will deceive? The very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. I like that assurance, don't you? If your neighbor says, Hey, you want to come to our congregation because the reverend says, Jesus is coming, and here's the date and place and time. In fact, he's got his own private jet. He'll be landing, and you'll want to be there to meet him. The scripture says, don't waste your time. Believe it not. I like those words, inasmuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. They will not deceive the very elect because it's not possible to deceive those who believe the truth. Do you believe that, friends? Yeah. So you know. You know the promise. You know He's coming soon. 
you know the purpose of his return. It's visible. It's literal. It needs to go, the message needs to go to the ends of this world. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, I would invite you to open your Bibles. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. In 26, it says, what, it, what does it profit if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with angels. And he, then, he, then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Christ will come with the glory of his Father to bring the rewards with him. There is the purpose. There is the promise. There is the purpose. There is the people. You see, Christ is patient. He wants this message to burn within our hearts. He wants this message to go forward to your friends, your neighbors, your relatives. If you had only 15 minutes to tell somebody about the second coming of Christ, take them to two chapters in the Bible. John chapter 14, the verses that we read today. There you find the promise. Take them to Matthew chapter 24. There you find the signs. And then take them to the place of quietness of Matthew, where you ask them, are you ready for Jesus to come? We have, we have the assurance that the promise is sure. We have the assurance that Christ is gone. We have the assurance that he is coming again. But I wonder what would happen if as an army of 150 people or so that are gathered here, we would determine just to tell one or two people about the promise. Do you know the promise that has been given to you that Jesus is coming back and wants to take you home? Some will say, no, I've never heard it. Tell me about it. Some will say, yes, I believe in Jesus and share with them the amazing promise that Jesus has given. The Bible says that no man knows what? No man knows the day or the hour of Jesus' coming. But I can tell you when it will be. There's one little word. It will be soon. Thank you, Lee. Soon and very soon. We have the promise, it's Jesus' purpose to come again and take us home, that where he is, we may be also. That promise brings us hope and assurance and is a great, great thing to share with others. We indeed are Jesus, and we have the hope and certainty of his soon return. As we bring our time together, you may be worshiping with us here in our sanctuary. You may be worshiping, streaming online. As we close our worship time together in the quietness of your heart, you may say, Pastor, well, that's a good promise, but I'm not sure that I'm ready. It's a good promise, but I've got things in my life that are not like Jesus. That's a wonderful promise, but I want a closer relationship with Jesus today. The message of that promise is that he's here today. 
His forgiveness, His grace is extended to us today that if He were to come tonight and there was no tomorrow for you, if you didn't wake up tomorrow when He calls you forth, things will be right with you as you open your heart to Him and ask Him to come in anew and fill your heart and life with a promise and assurance that we have clearly from the Word of God. These are truths not built on fables, but these are truths presented from the sacred throne of grace. Let us pray together. Father, you have given us, you have given us the gift of your only begotten Son, who, Father, died on the cross to make a sacrifice for our sins. And Lord, we've come into your house to worship you. And as we've done so, Father, in the quietness of this time, we thank you for this promise that you are coming soon. We grow impatient. We grow desirous that it might be soon. And Father, we come at times realizing we've turned our backs on you. We've distanced ourselves from you, that there are things in our life that need to be cleansed from our life. So those who are struggling, Father, in their relationship, you promised, you promised your presence in our lives, that you will be with us day by day until that day soon that we will be with you. So fill us with your spirit and with your power, and with your glory, that we will live for you victorious as we live our lives in Christ alone. Amen.